Hello and good morning. Welcome to our briefing, Climate Change, Loss and Damage. I'm Dan Brissett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. The Environmental and Energy Study Institute was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, we have also developed a program that provides technical assistance to utilities in rural areas interested in on-bill financing and beneficial electrification programs for their customers. EESI provides informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in briefings, written materials, and on social media. And all of our educational resources, including briefing recordings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and podcasts, are always available for free online at www.eesi.org. If you would like to make sure you always receive our latest educational resources, just take a moment to subscribe to our excellent bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Our briefing today is the second in our series, What Congress Needs to Know About COP27. Last week, we began our briefing series with a discussion about climate science and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's most recent findings as presented in the sixth assessment report. If you missed it, you can watch the archived webcast by visiting us online at www.esi.org. Today, we will focus on loss and damage, one of the issues expected to be a key topic of discussion at the 27th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or COP27 for short, in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. Next week, we will partner with U.S. Nature for Climate for a briefing about natural climate solutions. And then, just a few days before we leave for Egypt, we will take a step back and look over the issues that we expect to be on the table for the negotiations and how the international community could proceed toward meeting the challenge of global climate change. If you're not subscribed to ESI's bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions, or our special daily newsletter during COP, COP27 Dispatch, please take a moment to visit us online and subscribe at www.esi.org forward slash subscribe. You won't want to miss it. The issue of loss and damage refers to climate impacts that cannot be adapted to. Climate impacts are already being felt all across the globe, including here in the United States. But loss and damage afflicted by those impacts is not evenly distributed. And the abilities of different countries to deploy resources to respond varies greatly. So there is really no way to talk about loss and damage without acknowledging the disparities of wealth and resources between developed and less developed countries. Systemic inequities mean less developed and vulnerable countries will be hit first and worse by climate impacts. And as you can imagine, this can be a very difficult issue for negotiations. That is why we've brought together four panelists with deep expertise and experience in loss and damage and how it affects people in different parts of the world. Let me remind everyone that we will have some time for questions today during at the, after our panelists present, and we will do our best to incorporate questions from our online audience. If you have a question, you can send it to us via email, and the email address to use is ask at eesi.org, that's A-S-K at eesi.org, or even better, follow us on Twitter at EESI online and send it to us that way. It is my privilege to introduce the first of our four panelists today. Adele Thomas is a senior fellow at Climate Analytics and University of the Bahamas. Her research, uh, her particular research and policy focus is on aspects of social vulnerability, adaptation strategies, and loss and damage. Adele was a lead author on the IPCC sixth assessment report and the special report on 1.5 degrees Celsius, and has provided scientific and policy advisory services to a number of multilateral organizations and national institutions in the United States and throughout the Caribbean. Adele, welcome to our briefing today. And Ritu, would you mind turning your um, video off while Adele's, thank you so much. Adele, I'll turn it over to you. I can't wait for your presentation. Thanks, Dan, for the introduction, and hi, everyone. So in my presentation this morning, I'm really going to be setting the scene on the scientific findings on loss and damage. I will be drawing from the latest assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, where I was one of the lead authors. Oops. OK. So the IPCC's Working Group 2 report on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability was published earlier this year. And it was the culmination of over five years of work assessing thousands of scientific articles. This report provides the most robust assessment of research on loss and damage that the IPCC has provided to date. 
Um, and so I'll be getting into some of the findings from the IPCC on loss and damage. But before that, I'd just like to clarify the terminology and the definition that we used in the report. We refer to losses and damages as harm from observed impacts and projected risks due to climate change. And these losses and damages can be either economic or non-economic. Economic are harms where a monetary value can be assigned. So for example, the cost of repairing a building or rebuilding a road, or the cost of economic losses to a particular sector due to a climate impact, such as the loss of agricultural crops due to drought. Then there are non-economic losses and damages. And these are things that are not traded in markets. And so they are difficult to assign a monetary value to. Non-economic losses and damages include health impacts such as trauma, changes to biodiversity, loss of sense of community and culture. And so in our working group two report, we conducted a broad assessment of losses and damages across all world regions. And I'll highlight the three um, top messages from our assessment on losses and damages. The first key message is that losses and damages are already happening. Our current levels of global warming at 1.1 degrees Celsius have already caused dangerous and widespread losses and damages to nature and to billions of people. And this is despite our efforts to adapt to climate change. We see that there's an increase in human mortality due to extreme heat, so heat waves. We find bleaching of warm water coral, increases in areas burned by wildfires, adverse impacts from hurricanes, and all of this can be attributed to anthropogenic climate change. We are also seeing the widespread deterioration of ecosystems across world regions, as well as millions of people, particularly those in the global south, being exposed to acute food insecurity and reduced water security. This figure further illustrates some of the losses and damages already being experienced from climate change. And so this is an assessment of observed impacts of climate change on ecosystems. The darker the circle, the higher the level of confidence that we have in attributing these impacts to climate change. So across this global assessment, you can see that there is high confidence that we are seeing observed and attributed impacts in ecosystem structure, in species range shifts, and in changes in timing for terrestrial freshwater and ocean systems. We have also provided an assessment um, for different regions and particularly vulnerable areas. And you can see that there are varying levels of confidence depending on the available literature. But overall, um, we show that there are negative impacts and losses and damages being experienced in ecosystems around the world. We have also carried out this assessment for human systems. So again, here, the darker the circle, the higher the confidence we have in attributing impacts to climate change. A negative symbol means that um, there are increasing adverse effects. So this would be loss and damage. A positive and negative sign means that there are both increasing um, adverse and positive impacts, so both positive and negative benefits. At the global scale, you can see that there is medium confidence for mixed impacts for water scarcity, medium confidence in increasing adverse impacts in agriculture and crop um, production and for fisheries yields. We have high confidence of increasing adverse impacts, so losses and damages at the global scale for heat and malnutrition, for mental health, for displacement, for flooding, for damages to infrastructure. And again, we've carried this out for different world regions. And you can see that the majority of impacts that are being experienced are negative. So these are losses and damages. Um, and there are varying levels of confidence, again, based on the scientific literature that is available. 
We have also assessed non-economic loss and damage, and we show where there is scientific documentation of non-economic loss and damage already occurring. And so this map isn't exhaustive. It's meant to show examples of different types of non-economic losses and damages, which are associated with climate hazards that have been attributed to climate change. And we can see that these are being experienced across the globe. So there are examples of loss of agency, loss of biodiversity, loss of culturally meaningful places, and all of this is happening in different world regions. The scientific literature on non-economic loss and damage is not as advanced, and so we largely had to rely on examples to show that these are already occurring. The second key message coming from the report is that future losses and damages are projected to rise with increased global warming. So as global average temperatures increase, losses and damages will become more difficult to avoid and they will remain strongly concentrated among the poorest vulnerable populations. We find that the risks of future losses and damages are highest in areas that already already have high temperatures, such as tropical regions and places along coastlines and rivers and in frozen parts of the world. Coastal cities and settlements in particular face greater flood risks and low-lying coastal ecosystems such as mangroves will be submerged and lost. We also project increases in loss of biodiversity as well as the ecosystem services that they provide. And importantly, the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold is the point at which we can expect more irreversible losses to happen. Limiting global warming to one and a half degrees would substantially reduce projected losses and damages, but it will not completely eliminate them. So following the findings of the IPCC's, IPCC's earlier special report, which was focused on 1.5 degrees, we also find that 1.5 degrees is a critical threshold for losses and damages above which um, we will see escalating impacts. And the last key message is that losses and damages are unavoidable and are unequally distributed. We find that adaptation does not prevent all losses and damages. So despite climate action on adaptation, losses and damages are already being experienced and will continue to rise with global warming. We find that losses and damages are unequally distributed. So developing countries and vulnerable populations within all countries, um, and these vulnerable populations include people of low socioeconomic class, migrant groups, the elderly, women and children, are experiencing higher levels of losses and damages currently and are projected to also experience them in the future. We find that losses and damages are not comprehensively addressed by current financial governance and institutional arrangements. And this is particularly the case in vulnerable developing countries. And these arrangements are from the international scale. So what's happening at the UNFCCC down to national and subnational levels. The finance policies, strategies, and other solutions to address loss and damage are simply not enough currently. And to illustrate this point, small islands are one of the regions that are already facing disproportionate losses and damages and where the projected losses and damages, so what's coming up in the future, are particularly high. For small islands in particular, one and a half degrees is a critical threshold beyond which these islands may actually be unable to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Sea level rise poses an existential threat, particularly for low-lying areas that are already at or below current sea levels. We find that there is a risk of permanent and irreversible loss of terrestrial, marine, and coastal biodiversity, as well as the services that these ecosystems provide, such as coastal protection from storms or supporting livelihoods such as fisheries. There is the risk of economic decline due to losses and damages, 
and failure of sectors that these islands are dependent on economically, such as agriculture and tourism. Losses and damages in small islands may actually lead to reduced habitability, meaning that there will be displacement or permanent migration of people away from their homes along with non-economic losses, such as loss of sense of place, community, and culture. And while small islands face these disproportional levels of losses and damages, they currently lack the financial support, as well as governance, policy, and institutional capacities to address these risks. So in closing, the scientific evidence that we have from the IPCC's report is very clear that losses and damages are already being experienced, that they will rise with global warming, and that they are unavoidable and unequally distributed with disproportionate effects on developing countries and vulnerable groups. Losses and damages are a reality now, and there is a clear need for financial governance and institutional arrangements at multiple levels to address these, these issues. And that is in addition to adaptation and mitigation efforts. And thanks. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Dan. Thank you, Adele, for getting us started with that excellent presentation. Um, Adele had great slides. Our um, following panelists will also have great slides. Um, all of the presentation materials are available at www.eesi.org. So if you'd like to go back and revisit Adele's slides or rewatch her portion of the presentation or rewatch any of the briefing or review any of the presentation materials, uh, we have that available for you online. Our second panelist is Ritu Bharadwaj. She is a principal researcher at the International Institute for Environment and Development with more than 18 years of senior policy development research and management experience in government funding agencies and international NGOs. Ritu has worked extensively on social protection, climate resilience policy, planning and finance, forest and watershed management, resource conservation, and livelihood and gender issues. Ritu, welcome to our briefing today. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, uh, Daniel. So, you know, what a great uh, start for my presentation because Adele has already uh, prepared the background for it. And uh, so one of the most important issues that developing countries uh, will be raising at, loss, at COP27 will be loss and damage. So while loss and damage has been within the climate change agenda for a very long time, in fact, right since 1990, um, uh, relatively very little progress has been made on tackling this issue. And the debate on loss and damage has always remained politically contentious, which has also meant that there hasn't been much progress uh, on trying to develop solutions or trying to address some of the issues that was presented in the previous presentation. Uh, can I go to the next slide, please? So while you know, while we are still uh, carrying out these discussions around uh, loss and damage uh, in the international uh, negotiation space, countries and communities are already facing loss and damage, and and these are of unprecedented scale now. You know, most recently, the media reports that you saw about uh, the floods in Pakistan or the floods in Nigeria, these are unprecedented scale. And they're not just the scale which matters, it's also the frequency that matters. Because if you look at 2017 data of Caribbean, they faced three uh, category five hurricanes. Uh, and you are hardly able to recover from one event and you're faced with another, which means that you are in a constant rebuilding phase. So you're, you're in perpetually you are, you are always recovering from one event and you're faced with another. And what it has meant is, for many countries, this has completely wiped out their GDP. And so what, can we go to the next slide, please? So what is really needed right now is to understand as to what, like, because loss and damage is not occurring in isolation. It, is, it occurs on top of the development deficit that the countries and communities are already facing. So if you look at that slide here, we actually undertook a regression analysis on the kind of multidimensional risks that countries and communities are facing and to what extent their loss and damage risks, uh, to what extent they're prone to loss and damage risks. And you can clearly see that the least developed countries are the ones which are the most, uh, most prone to these, uh, you know, to these damaging impacts of loss and damage. And there are a range of factors which govern this. So there are institutional issues. So if 
countries have weak institutions, they have weak governance arrangement, they don't have a good social protection mechanism, their social dimensions are weak, uh, then the impact of loss and damage is felt, felt much higher. So while we are trying to understand or address loss and damage, we have to take all these factors into consideration. It's not just climate risks that we need to consider. We have to under, understand it from a multi-dimensional risk perspective. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. So while countries like, um, like Germany also faced flood last year, they were able to rebuild and not just recover, they recovered better from their previous situation. But you can't expect the same from countries like Nigeria or Pakistan. So, you know, so and, and that's the reason why when we started uh, work on this issue, we took a more practical approach to understanding what these issues are, what are the realities of loss and damage, and how it can be addressed. And as you saw in the previous slide, much of these issues are very contextual in nature. And therefore, the, the, the solutions or the practical approaches to dealing with them will also have to be very tailored and take into consideration all the other issues that are compounding the, the, the impacts of climate risks. And that's why we undertook a very bottom-up approach to how we deal with it. Because if you look, go out and, and just type uh, loss and damage in Google, you'll, you'll get thousands of papers on loss and damage. But most of them, are they are about trying to conceptualize loss and damage, or they talk about how do we undertake um, the landscape of risk analysis and so on. But not many of them talk about what are the realities of loss and damage. How are countries and communities actually uh, facing loss and damage? Or how are they actually trying to deal with them? Uh, next slide, please. So that's why, that's why we undertook this effort last year, where we tried to generate these evidences very, very bottom up, uh, particularly in, time, in terms of understanding what are the, and, and for this, we engaged all the authors from the global south. So we understood what are their sufferings and how it's compounding their existing risks, such as around poverty, health, marginalization, conflict in some cases, in 12 different geographies. And these were uh, from Asia, from Africa and Pacific. And I, in my next slide, I will show you, uh, you know, the, the regions where we covered, but most of these, uh, so what we did as, as a result of, as part of this analysis, uh, and we did this, co-generated this evidence uh, base with them, was to understand what are the issues that they're currently facing in terms of climate risk, how it is compounding, how are they dealing with it? Because some of the countries and communities are already, they, they are taking some good measures and they need to be acknowledged, understood, and seen whether they can be scaled up in other contexts or not. But also trying to understand what are the gaps in terms of their technology, infrastructure, finance, uh, knowledge base, capacity, and so that it can then be addressed through either techn technical assistance or through financing support and so on. So what you can see, so I'll just quickly highlight some of the key findings. So you look at all those case study locations, and one thing which was common across these 12 locations, irrespective, because some of these areas face glacial lake outburst, some of them face uh, um, a drought, some desertification, sea level rise, floods, and cyclone. But irrespective of the type of climate impacts they were facing, one thing was common, and that was post displacement and distress migration. And we also found that among those who were displaced or, and who were marginalized, they were becoming victims of modern slavery and human trafficking. And we have some, and beyond this case study assessment, we also undertook a much more detailed quantitative assessment of to, to the extent to which uh, migration is happening because of climate impacts and the extent to which those who are forced to undertake distress migration or displacement become subjected to trafficking and uh, modern slavery. Uh, next slide, please. And we also like, and this was again highlighted in Edel's presentation as well, that loss and damage is creating a lot of physical health, mental health, and other well-being issues. Uh, and, and it is true for both people who have, uh, who are pushed into distress migration and displacement, and even those who are not able to migrate or, or who don't have the means to migrate, um, because migration in many places are acting as a resilience uh, uh, um, uh, approach to deal or cope with those impacts. So what we really, we, we, we found out from the ground was these recurring, because as I said, these climatic impacts are not occurring. It's not like one-off incidents. The frequency of many of these climatic impacts are increasing. 
So because it's 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 occurring one after the other, it's leading to a, a constant uh, a feeling of worry, a sadness, and anger, and tiredness, and something that we found out, you know, very strongly from uh, the case study from the Cook Island, uh, uh, from the Lake Chad Basin, and so on. Similarly, we saw that as people's resource base starts diminishing. For example, in Bangladesh, Urujar, every household had been displaced at least three to seven times, which means, and they said every time they got displaced, uh, their resource base started deteriorating. So even if, even a person who was like uh, well off, over the period of third or fourth displacement, their resource base have took them below the poverty line. And when that happens, it increases uh, domestic violence, women are subjected to more uh, emotional distress. Uh, many young girls get, uh, uh, you know, they are forced into early marriages because when people see their uh, land eroding, they rush to marry off their daughters and so on. And even when displacements are happening, something that we saw in Lake Chad Basin, you know, because, you know, and their uh, climate impacts are being compounded by conflict issues, it, it's leading to overcrowding of camps, and that's leading to outbreak of hygiene-related issues because obviously the sanitation facilities in these locations are not very good. Even 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 if people are not living in in camps, they are pushed into staying in informal settlements uh, outside cities, and there again they are subjected to poor shelter, poor sanitary conditions. And we saw that many of them, as I mentioned earlier, they're subjected to exploitative working condition because obviously they move in despair, they don't have a good bargaining power, and therefore, you know, uh, they, they, they do not have any support system, uh, any accidental insurance. And I talked to one of the migrants and he said, when we move, we, we sometimes we come back, sometimes our dead bodies come back because they know that when they are moving and when they are working in these mines and, uh, and dangerous working conditions, they might die, but that's the only option that's left for them. Um, then again, there is uh, increased Im impact on women who are left behind and something that we saw in Chitrakoot in India, where uh, it was leading to sanitation hygiene issues, especially menstrual hygiene, because the water uh, availability had become an issue. Children both staying back as well as migrating were facing mental and emotional trauma and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So while these issues are there, we also try to find out what are the practical solutions? Or how do we deal with them? And for that, we organize a series of deliberative dialogue because, and in this, we, we know that loss and damage has been a, a, a contentious issue, a sick issue. And they are like, whenever you go to a country, the first people you talk about loss and damage and the people who typically go and sit in negotiations are the ones who come and talk to you, but they are not the ones who actually deal with the issue on the ground level. So in this deliberative dialogue process, we wanted to make sure that we bring together all those people who are dealing with this on the front line, people who are from the development sector, people who are from the humanitarian sector, for them to come in and then come out with what are the practical ways in which we can address some of this. And for that, we organize this, a series of four deliberative dialogue process. Uh, next slide, please where we try to understand responses to some of these burning questions that we had. Firstly, what are the realities of loss and damage and what we should be considering when we are trying to respond to it. So firstly, the first thing that came up was we need to understand the nature of loss and damage. And for that, we need a proper operational framework. We need to integrate, like typically, as you saw in Ada's uh, presentation, we try to categorize them as economic and non-economic loss and damage. And the, but what they said, was we need to understand it from secondary and tertiary impacts. For example, when people are forced into distress migration and that leads to uh, trafficking, or that leads to uh, uh, anxiety and mental health and other issues. So they wanted that framing to be from that context. Then they, they also wanted to say that climate impacts are very dynamic. So there are some uh, issue, uh, risks that we might feel are, uh, are can be dealt with adaptation, but suddenly the, the frequency of that impact, incre that risk increases, and then it moves in the category of loss and damage. So they said that these impacts are very dynamic and therefore responses need to be dynamic. Early action is the key. The second was what are the critical elements we should be considering uh, in, in terms of managing loss and damage risks. So there was a huge focus on uh, creating institutional capacity, having risk management tools, integrating risks in the, in, in the planning process, and con considering gender and intersectionality. 
and also look at some of the existing measures. For example, there are pathways approach, there are social protection programs. How can we layer them? How can we bring them together so that we can respond to loss and damage uh, risks in a more holistic way? And one thing that really came out very strongly was how do we engage that citizen engagement, a community engagement in decision making process was really highlighted as a very strong action, especially because a lot of loss and damage response uh, requires anticipatory movement or movement of people or livelihood shifts. And they said that to take such, uh, such uh, big decisions, it's always important to engage community and society in, in all this decision making process. So there's a buy-in uh, and, and a mutual trust created. Next slide, please. Then we, we try to understand that what are the type of action and support needed to tackle loss and damage. So firstly was around the use and misuse of climate science, because we typically use a lot of, um, uh, we bring together a lot of uh, outputs of different climate models and then try to average it. But one thing that came out was around the fat tail event, like we typically, we tend to not take consideration of uh, climate impact that might be created, uh, but has low, low probability of occurring. So what they suggested was, that we should be considering climate uh, response, response to climate risks for, a, for the complete range of uh, risks rather than only taking into consideration those risks which have high probability. Uh, then again, the issues around uh, proper communication of climate information so that that can be integrated into planning and so on. Then again, dyna dynamic interaction between adaptation and loss and damage, that's something which I talked about in my previous slide as well. But again, the, uh, the need for risk-informed planning process, early warning system, uh, equipping uh, communities uh, with, with, uh, with adequate tools um, uh, to uh, undertake a risk assessment and also responding to them was uh, something which was really highlighted. Uh, then again, they said, why only look at long-term events? They also wanted uh, the responses to look into small and medium uh, events as well, because that they said that's the one that then gradually start eroding their, uh, their, 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 their limits of managing existing adaptation options. Uh, again, a lot of focus was given on institutional and governance mechanism, um, on the, uh, you know, focus around uh, longer term thinking, uh, strengthening uh, governance arrangements. So, uh, for example, a lot of issue was raised around the transparency around existing humanitarian action um, and, and the participation and inclusion of the most vulnerable whenever we are trying to uh, create such institutional or governance mechanism around managing loss and damage. Next slide, please. Uh, thirdly, we try to understand how those, you know, those solutions can be delivered more effectively. And for that, localized delivery capacity uh, was really emphasized in a big way, uh, engaging uh, uh, civil society organizations. For example, Slum and Shlag, uh, SDIS, Slum and uh, Shag Dwellers International uh, representatives were there, and they shared a lot of their experience, and they explained how engaging community in this whole process really helped in um, getting a better buy-in, having a faster response mechanism, to any humanitarian uh, issues that were created. Then also enabling agile and flexible action. So we need cross-sectoral uh, coordination, a whole of a government and a whole of a society approach. Longer term asset management um, uh, needs to be incorporated. And then again, they said, you know, risk information should not just remain within the domain of policymakers. It should be provided to the communities and it should be, uh, communities should be engaged into how they respond to those different types of risk because the, the type of risk that we think are important may not be relevant for them. Communities might prioritize some other risk that may be uh, more important to them than the, than the policymakers. Uh, then flexibility around planning, because they said, um, uh, going back to my previous slide, is it, it, the impacts are very dynamic and the responses have to be dynamic too. And then also enabling mobility and livelihood, livelihood shifts, something that came out from previous presentation and you know even from a case study assessment that mobility was a big factor so you know even right now we have a lot of these social protection programs that provide safety net but they're not portable so the moment the communities are forced to move those safety nets are not available around them so how do we create enable mobility patterns which are safe which are uh, pre-planned and they are moved towards opportunity rather than uh, towards greater risks uh, next slide, please. 
And this is the last uh, question that we try to understand from them as to how, like, we understood what action and support is needed, how it can be delivered. And the final questions, uh, response uh, question from them was to understand how we can uh, uh, deliver finances to addressing some of these action and support that was identified by them. So one thing that clearly came out was it, it, you know, that loss and damage finance has to be separate. It cannot be clubbed with adaptation finance because the responses to loss and damage will have to be much different from the way adaptation measures are taken. It has to be most, more agile. There has to be a more agile and responsive window for immediate uh, humanitarian response, but also medium, short-term and the long-term uh, responses around effective infrastructure, effective uh, migratory uh, migration movement, uh, around livelihood shifts that people might have to undertake and so on. And then there was also uh, very clearly highlighted that we need to take the finances to the most vulnerable uh, communities and also countries. And how do we, like, like there have to be certain principles that should be guiding how uh, the finance is delivered to, to the, or, or distributed uh, amongst the least developed countries or and the other developing countries and so on. And in terms of sources of finance, um, it, you know, we did identify some of the existing sources of finance, for example, around social protection, uh, around the insurance mechanism. But what was, uh, what really came out that no one mechanism would be sufficient. So we'll have to probably layer a lot of these finance, financing uh, uh, mechanisms in order to respond to uh, loss and damage in a more holistic way. So I'll stop there. Uh, and I'll be happy because I, I probably rushed through much, much of these responses. But if you look at, uh, yeah, if you look at some of these, uh, um, these publications that I've listed here, you'll get more details. And this, uh, and I really feel, I, I thought that these four deliberative dialogue process that we did, it really helped in coming out with practical responses, things that community and countries at the front line who are actually dealing with loss and damage on a daily basis, they are the ones uh, who understand the solutions best. So back to you, Daniel. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, covered lots of really interesting questions. Um, speaking of questions, um, there are still opportunities, of course, to ask questions to our panelists. You can do that two ways. First is by sending us an email, and the email address to use is ask at eesi.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at eesi online. Ritu reminded me. Uh, as we were talking, as she was talking about international climate finance, one year ago today, October 20th, 2021, we held a briefing in our COP26 briefing series, and it was called the role of international climate finance. And we had five uh, panelists join us that day to talk about the importance of international climate finance, not just the quantity of the finance, but also the quality of the finance. So if anyone would like to learn a little bit more about that issue, actually a lot more about that issue. I encourage you to check out our briefing from last year, a year ago today, coincidentally. It's a really, really good one. Our third panelist is Kaveh Gillenpour. Kaveh is the Vice President for International Strategies at the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, overseeing the international aspects of their work, including the work that relates to the UN negotiations process. Prior to C2ES, Kaveh held various positions, including legal advisor on the United Kingdom and European Union's international climate negotiating teams, the United Kingdom's head of the UNFCCC negotiations, co-lead negotiator on climate change for the European Union, co-lead negotiator on climate change for the Alliance of Small Island States, head of the Secretariat of the High Ambition Coalition, and principal advisor on climate change to the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Kaveh recently served as a senior member of the UN Secretary General's Climate Action Team. Kaveh, welcome to our briefing today. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, uh, Daniel. It's um, it's a real uh, privilege and uh, an honor to be invited and also to, to speak to uh, congressional staffers and others. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me. You've already uh, introduced me uh, better than I could have done. So I think we can... Um, just say that we're, we're running a major project at CTUES that's going to be looking ever more deeply at this issue of loss and damage. And as we heard from both uh, Adele and Ritu, this is a, a serious issue that's only just going to get more and more prominent, both internationally, but also domestically around the world as the impacts of climate change uh, 
get worse and more visible, which they unfortunately will do. If we could go to the next slide, please. I've been asked um, essentially to speak about three issues. So the, uh, the expectations for COP27 in terms of what the outcomes might be there, uh, and also to, uh, to explore possible landing zones as to what we might expect at, in, in a little over four weeks' time when we get to Sharm el-Sheikh, and also to reflect on the position of the United States in the international negotiations on loss and damage, both uh, in the past but also now. So next slide, please. So I think before we get on to what we can expect from COP27 on the issue of loss and damage, it's important to recall what countries agreed to in Glasgow uh, around 11 months ago now. Uh, so there's two main uh, deliverables that were mandated from Glasgow that are relevant for this COP. First of all, it was agreed that COP27 should essentially operationalize something called the Santiago Network. And that is a network that is meant to move actors together and respond through a more structured and demand-driven system to assess the needs and identify technical assistance and, uh, and availability of that assistance and to essentially connect various stakeholders around the world on the issue of loss and damage. That's due to be operationalized at COP27 through a formal decision, which will need the consensus of all parties there. And while some technical issues are still open on that issue, the, uh, on that topic, the signs are good that the, um, that the COP will agree and operationalize that. And it's important that the COP does that because it needs to follow through on tasks that have been set for it. But we need to understand clearly that agreeing to that alone won't be enough to satisfy the growing demands of developing countries on loss and damage. And it doesn't address uh, fundamental issues around climate finance for loss and damage, uh, which I'll come to. The second uh, mandated deliverable or process coming out of the uh, out of Glasgow dialogue uh, out of Glasgow was something called the Glasgow Dialogue, which was established at COP26. And this is a process that will culminate in 2024 and brings together parties, that's countries, relevant organisations, and stakeholders to discuss the arrangements for funding of activities to avert, minimize, and address loss and damage. The first Glasgow Dialogue was held in June of this year, um, and it's important to remind ourselves that one of the main drivers that led to the Glasgow Dialogue being established was the call by developing countries for the establishment of a loss and damage finance facility. Uh, and, and also to remember that, that Glasgow did not reach consensus on whether or not a, a, a facility should, should be established. So essentially, the Glasgow Dialogue, which is a discussion forum on this topic, was the compromise that was reached on that. However, subsequent concerns that the Glasgow Dialogue uh, is, is a talk shop with no real political oversight or accountability or a clear mandate for a deliverable has led developing country parties to come forward as a united bloc of some 140 countries to propose a new agenda item for COP27 that looks at this issue of establishing a finance facility. Now, this is likely to be the most contentious issue at COP27 from the negotiations perspective, uh, and it's particularly contentious and opposed by developed country parties for a number of reasons. First of all, they argue that it's not what was agreed to in Glasgow by consensus and that it prejudges the outcome of the Glasgow Dialogue, which was a discussion forum to essentially address this issue over a, over a two year period. So agreeing on a facility already would prejudge that outcome and accelerate the timeline. And also developed countries have a concern that it's not really clear how establishing a new finance facility would be effective or efficient. For example, exploration needs to be made of whether existing funds and facilities could be used. And there are also some concerns potentially over legal implications of establishing a fund. So the reason why this is important is that it could impact the wider negotiations and the mood uh, and also divert attention and um, an effort away from other matters that are also important. And the COP's 
traditionally open with an open plenary where the agenda for the meeting is adopted. And because this has not yet been agreed as an agenda item, it's possible that this could dominate the opening phase of the COP. But of course, we're coming into the COP in the context of increasing impacts of climate change. We've seen the devastating impacts on, on Pakistan, but that's one of a number of countries. So we're going into COP27 with that context, but also, uh, frankly, with a failure of developed country parties yet to deliver on their promise of 100 billion per year in climate finance by 2020. So that, that sort of mood is not very helpful going into the COPs and, and all of that makes this issue of loss and damage a contentious issue. Having said that, I think there is a potential landing zone. Whilst I don't think that the conditions are right for consensus to establish a new facility at COP27, there is increasing recognition of the need for uh, increased finance for loss and damage. I think there is scope to agree on agenda item on this issue at COP27 that is wider in scope that looks beyond only the issue of addressing loss and damage from a finance perspective, but also at minimizing and averting loss and damage. And as a result, to strengthen the mandate of the Glasgow Dialogue to show to ensure that it does have political oversight and also to ensure that it does result in a clear deliverable when it, it concludes in 2024. But that's far from a foregone conclusion. That's just my sense of where we could land on this. If we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. So I've been asked to uh, to speak a little bit about the US position, and many in the audience will know more about this than I do. So I'm uh, I'm treading carefully here and being a little bit cautious. But from the outside perspective, um, the US has uh, in the past had particular concerns over ensuring that no legal basis for compensation or liability is established through the work on loss and damage. And it was instrumental in securing clarity at the time of adoption of the Paris Agreement that the Paris Agreement would not establish such a liability. Uh, um, another, a number of developed countries also hold that position. Uh, so there'll be a, a lot of concern to ensure that any work or establishment of a new facility on loss and damage doesn't go back on that agreement in Paris. And this issue has been a red line one for the US, but also uh, other developed countries, because there's no political support for this uh, in their countries, really. There's legal concerns about this. There's policy concerns in that it's not clear that the issue of compensation liability would really take forward loss and damage. But also there's questions about who ultimately would be in the frame if there, if there was, was to be a regime of compensation or liability. So essentially, that is uh, that the notion of compensation liability is not on the agenda, uh, but there are concerns that any establishment of a fund would be within that understanding. The developing country proposal for a new agenda item is made both under the Paris Agreement and the Convention, and it's important to note that the um, while the Paris Agreement was clear on the issue of compensation liability and also moved away from a, a blunt division of obligations between developed and developing countries on issues such as finance, the Convention does not have those assurances or that uh, nuancing of division of responsibilities between developed and developing countries. So the fact that this agenda item is being proposed both under the Paris Agreement and the Convention raises concerns uh, about the legal, legal implications, and I don't see how it will be possible to agree this agenda item under the Convention because it doesn't have those assurances I refer to, and it's very blunt on the issue of finance. And then finally, the, the US position sort of historically and, and more recently, traditionally the US has been viewed as a bit of an outlier on the question of compensation and liability and loss and damage in particular, but I don't think that that's really a fair representation. I think the US is, is very prominent on this issue given its geopolitical strength, um, but also that because it's been very vocal on the question of loss, loss and damage. But many countries, developed countries in particular, share that view. And you also have to ask if this issue of finance for loss and damage uh, 
was broadened uh, in beyond just the um, the donor base of developed countries, whether, for example, emerging economies would still be in favor of establishing this fund. And also given that the emerging economies will be increasingly responsible in the future for the loss and damage that ha occurs around the world because of the proportion of emissions that they have. Um, I think the the notion that the US is on its own on this issue is not really one that I think is correct. Having said that as well, the US has been increasingly constructive on engaging on the substance of loss and damage. Uh, the US was very vocal on and very clear that loss and damage had to be taken forward as an issue at COP26. And also when you hear the uh, the interventions and the speeches of uh, Secretary Kerry, uh, the, the special envoy on climate change for the president, it's clear that the US is engaging on this issue and does want to find a way forward. And it needs to, because in conclusion, as countries fail to do what's necessary to limit global temperature increases to within 1.5 degrees Celsius, and as we see global impacts becoming more frequent and severe, the demands for loss and damage around the globe will only increase. And this is going to be an issue that not only dominates the climate negotiations, but in my view, clearly is going to become a top geopolitical issue that will shape foreign policy of the US and many other countries around the world. So with that, back to you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation and for your perspective and um, thoughts about how things will go or could go at COP27. Our fourth panelist is Taylor Dimsdale. Taylor is the director of E3G's Risk and Resilience Program. He works with governments, public institutions, and the private sector to ensure their decision making is informed by a better understanding of climate risk. Taylor also works with a broad based and diverse coalition of organizations to build economic, social, and climate resilience. Taylor's areas of expertise include risk assessment and management, the geopolitics of decarbonization, and the implications of climate change for national and international security. He also has experience in sustainable finance and energy policy, and all of that adds up to making Taylor an excellent panelist for today. So pa Taylor, thank you for joining us. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thanks very much, uh, Daniel, and thank you also to Anna and the whole team at EESI for, for organizing this panel discussion. It's really um, a pleasure to be here with you and I'm, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to speak. Um, I think the other panelists have, have made my job uh, much easier and, and Kave had a great sort of segue into my, my presentation. Um, so that's very helpful. Uh, you know, we've covered sort of the scientific basis around loss and damage, um, you know, action and responses on the ground, the context around COP27. I really just wanted to talk briefly about sort of the broader geopolitics of this as an issue and how that might relate um, in particular to uh, US national interests. Um, and I'll, I'll think about that from three angles. If we move to the next slide, please. Um, so first on, on the geopolitics and thinking in particular about how other countries see this issue. Um, second, on uh, national and international security um, implications. And, and finally, around uh, essentially potential lessons for the US from stronger um, engagement and international cooperation on, on loss and damage. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, firstly, on, on geopolitics, um, uh, and, and Kave, again, set this up very well, I think, I think it's becoming very clear that climate change, including the physical risks of, of climate impacts, is now a geopolitical issue. It's discussed in bilateral diplomacy and the G7, the G20, UN Security Council, UN General Assembly, you know, most multilateral um, venues and, and, and bilateral negotiations. Um, and I've pulled out some of the recent sort of headlines that I think help illustrate this. So. So as we've already heard, you know, part of the, the, the disappointments uh, around COP26 was based on the lack of progress on this agenda, um, loss and damage and, and adaptation in particular. Um, but also, you know, countries are increasingly facing um, high levels of debt distress. Uh, now that's for a lot of different reasons, but it's in part because as we've already heard, they're spending a significant share of their GDP 
often well above 100% um, on disaster recovery. Um, and then again, as, we, as we've heard previously, um, climate is uh, one of the drivers of these second and third order uh, effects like food insecurity, uh, water scarcity, um, other systems and resources that we all really rely on for, for global stability. And so I think, you know, a key point here for me is that, you know, regardless of the state of the debate and understanding in the U.S., you know, this urgent need to address impacts both in terms of those immediate physical effects, but also some of the longer lasting, you know, second and third order impacts around uh, of, of hurricanes, droughts, floods, et cetera. And something that's very quickly rising up the agenda and the list of political priorities, you know, for many developing countries, including some that are, that are key strategic U.S. allies. So you have these countries that are looking for progress in, on this agenda for support. Um, and I think, you know, at least in many cases, you know, just looking at some of the public statements that are made, climate, they're, they're not seeing climate change as somehow divorced from other foreign policy or diplomatic issues. So it's in the same arena as, uh, as trade, uh, as security relationships on technology cooperation. Um, and so that's just to say, I think you could see implications, um, as, as I think Cave was starting to say, they go well beyond the sort of immediate and more obvious uh, context of the UNFCCC, um, if there is a failure to, to, to make some progress in this, in this area. Um, secondly, if we go to the next slide, on the sort of um, uh, implications for, for national and international security. Um, and, and I just want to start by saying there, there was a, a, a survey done by the American Security Project several years ago that showed that about almost three quarters of countries around the world have recognized climate change as a national security issue in, in one form or another. Um, so again, I think that's just, that's an interesting sort of bit of evidence in, in, in thinking about how other countries are viewing this issue. Um, but I've also pulled out some excerpts from the uh, US National Intelligence Estimate, which was released last year. This was the first sort of comprehensive NIE on climate change that the, that the National Intelligence Council has, has done. And I just wanna take a minute to read a few of the, of the quotes because I think they're, they're fairly stark. So first of all, um, we assess that climate change will increasingly exacerbate risks to US national security interests as the physical impacts increase in geopolitical tensions mount. Secondly, um, elsewhere as temperatures rise and more extreme effects manifest, there's a growing risk of conflict over water and migration, particularly after 2030. And then finally, intensifying physical effects of climate change will be most acutely felt in developing countries, which we assess are also least able to adapt to such changes. These effects will increase the potential for instability and possibly internal conflict, in some cases creating additional demands on US diplomatic, economic, humanitarian, and military resources. Um, and again, you know, this is not sort of decades and decades into the future. This is, this is essentially right around the corner. Um, and, you know, this can be seen in tandem with evidence that's also been uh, released fairly recently about um, the overlap between countries that are at a high risk of conflict and those that are highly vulnerable for um, the climate change impacts, again, some of which are in strategically important um, regions for the U.S. So, you know, I want to clarify, you know, loss and damage as it's understood and discussed within the UNFCCC. Is, is not a security issue, um, and nor should it be. Um, however, I think you know, security and defense foreign policy analysts, um, many of them have been clear that a failure to address climate impacts is very much uh, a, a matter of international, national human security. Um, and clearly, I think some of the measures that are being discussed in terms of um, a, a loss and damage response are part of that sort of toolkit for, for responding to, to climate impacts. And then finally, if we move to the next slide, um, on the sort of issue of broader international cooperation and, and maybe lessons domestically, um, you know, as has already been mentioned, um, I'm sure everyone is, is very aware of here, uh, the US is not immune to climate impacts. Uh, you can see pretty clearly from this, this chart, uh, the cost has been rising very consistently. Just looking at the past five years, disasters have cost the U.S. about three quarters of a trillion dollars with an average annual cost of $150 billion, which is 
much higher than the than the 42 year inflation adjusted annual cost. Um, the U.S. is spending so much money, in fact, on disasters that uh, state and local governments have already been warned by credit rating agencies that their credit rating is at risk. I don't think it's too big of a leap to say that um, at some point, uh, given the, the, the increasing risk of climate change, the sovereign credit of the U.S. could be um, under threat, which is, of course, is what allows the U.S. to borrow money so cheaply. So this, this is a very material risk. Um, uh, and yet, you know, there is no comprehensive, you know, U.S. response to loss and damage either. Now it has the benefit, of course, of being able to uh, spend the money to recover and to build back. Um, but there's not sort of a comprehensive um, approach to, to L&D. Meanwhile, you have many low and middle income countries who have built up vast experience at this point with, you know, low cost, efficient approaches to, uh, to climate impacts, to disaster response and recovery um, without the benefit of large public budgets. So, I mean, as we've heard, part of the conversation around loss and damage is about finance. It's also about technical assistance, broader international cooperation. I don't think it's strange credulity to say that there could be useful lessons um, for developed countries as well that choose to engage more constructively in this space. Well, obviously recognizing that the priority really is to provide support to those countries um, that are on the front lines uh, and have the lowest capacity to, to adapt. Um, so I, I will stop there, um, but thanks very much for your, for your time and, and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Taylor. I'm looking forward to the discussion too. And while um, our other three panelists turned their videos back on, let me just remind everyone once again, uh, that the archived webcast as well as presentation materials will be available online at www.esi.org. And when you visit, it would be a real shame if you didn't sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions, our daily COP newsletter that will start at the beginning of COP27, COP27 Dispatch, uh, and um, pretty much just check out all of our other resources because they're all really good. So we are going to engage in our questions and answers, uh, a little bit of a moderated discussion. And Kaveh, I understand that you will be departing us a little bit early today, which is entirely fine. Uh, we totally understand. Um, so I'm actually going to start with you. Um, and uh, obviously, we'll allow other panelists to respond as well. But we'll start the Q&A with you. Um, you talked a little bit about what happened at COP26. You talked a little bit about broader um, where loss and damage fits in. Um, countries are building up to the first global stock take under the Paris Agreement. And I would like, first of all, if you could help our audience understand what the global stock take is, and then also how could loss and damage potentially be built into the process of the global stock take? And what would that mean for future efforts to address loss and damage? Thank you for the question, Daniel. I appreciate it. We at CTS, we're, we're doing a major project looking at the issue of the global stock take. So th thanks for asking. That question. I, I would. Sh I should start by saying, the pa the Paris Agreement has an inbuilt ambition mechanism in it, and that operates on a five year cycle. And the global stock tick is at the height heart of that five year cycle. You could say that it's the sort of beating heart of the Paris Agreement. And every five years, parties, countries, uh, and and other stakeholders will come together to basically see where we are in terms of delivering on the long-term objectives of the Paris Agreement, including limiting temperatures to 1.5 or below, uh, and also to identify opportunities to enhance ambition and to go further faster, and so inform the updating of future climate targets in line with those overarching objectives. And the US was uh, very much at the, at the heart of agreeing that five-year cycle. So COP26 launched the first of those five-year cycles with the global stock take. It's currently in a sort of technical information gathering and assessment phase in what are known as three technical dialogues. The first happened in June, the second will happen at COP27 in November, and the third will happen in June next year. And all of that information will be compiled and then it will go be handed over to ministers at COP28 to decide essentially what will be the, the imperatives and signals coming out as countries look to the next phase of raising their climate targets. So that's why it's important. You also mentioned, and it's it's uh, it's been a little bit forgotten, but the mandate for 
the uh, par, uh, the global stock tick in the Paris Agreement does mention loss and damage as a cross-cutting issue. So it, it's definitely there. The difficulty is that it's still not clear how that will intersect with the global stock take on an operational basis. Certainly, it has been raised in the context of the technical dialogues and parties and other stakeholders are free to do that. But much of this first global stock take is essentially building the, the airplane while we're trying to fly it in the sense that some aspects are still not entirely clear about how that will intersect. But we still have over a year to go. And as I say, loss and damage is being raised in the context of the technical dialogues. And no, no doubt the parties will also raise that when it goes into the political phase. But it's very much a, a context and cross-cutting issue that will need to be taken into account. So thanks, Daniel. Thanks. And Adele and Ritu and Taylor, please feel free if you have anything you'd like to build on what Kave said about the global stock take and, and where loss and damage could potentially fit in. Yeah, just sorry. I'll Ruby, so I'll go first. Um, just building on what Kevin said, with the technical dialogue phase, it's currently um, broken down into three areas, adaptation, mitigation, and then means of implementation and support. And what we've been seeing at the first technical dialogue is that countries, developing countries in particular, are really bringing up loss and damage in all three of those spaces. So it is, you know, being cross-cutting. But what countries are also pushing for is for there to be a dedicated space to discuss loss and damage so that it's not lost amongst the shuffle. So as the global stock take progresses and as the plane is being built, then perhaps having a dedicated space for loss and damage as a key topic um, instead of being, you know, under and across all of them may help, particularly as we start seeing loss and damage escalate. So maybe there will be four key topics, adaptation, mitigation, loss and damage, and means of implementation and um, support. Thanks. I just wanted to come in more from a practical approach. So, you know, how do you do a global stock take? Uh, and is only if countries or you know uh, least developed country or developing countries mention loss and damage in their climate action plan which is called nationally determined contributions and recently almost like a month back we did an assessment of 46 uh, ndcs of the least developed countries and one thing that clearly came out only 12 of them mentioned loss and damage in any form uh, and and even so we even tried to understand whether um, whether countries were not men using the term loss and damage, but they were using residual risk or other risk to to uh, to uh, to talk about loss and damage. But you know, even considering all those factors, we could only find that of all the least developed countries, only eleven of them mentioned it any in any way. And only countries, for example, Vanuatu, uh, Cambodia, Myanmar, um, and and. Uh, Nepal mentioned it in some details, which means that unless and until they mention loss and damage uh, in the like, I think NDCs are the formal document through which least developed countries or developing countries, you know, uh, put forth their demand for what what their need is in terms of uh, finance, what their need is in terms of technology, infrastructure, and so on. And that's not very clear. Uh, so that's something that I would really urge least developed countries to do it so that it comes into a formal mechanism and then global stock take could take uh, note of that. Uh, the second is around uh, Santiago network for loss and damage. So, so it's not just finance, so it's also technical support that countries uh, are demanding. And uh, while Santiago network was established in 2019, it's remained defunct for a very long time. So right now we have the functions agreed in the last uh, COP, but what we don't have still, and this is still remained a contentious issue between developed and developing country, is where it will be housed, how its functions would be, who's going to control the, uh, the whole way in which uh, the demands are uh, uh, requisitioned and it's met. So these developed countries have a lot of issues around that as to whether it's going to remain another GCF kind of a mechanism where there is fund, but it's very hard to get access to those funds. So in the same way, they, they understand their Santiago network, but they want to understand whether that would be accessible by them or not. And I think uh, you know, we work very closely with these developed country group, LDC group. And one thing that they don't want to wait for is the Glasgow dialogue process to culminate 
for them to understand what kind of financing support would be available to them. And that's the reason why they have raised that, uh, you know, G77 plus China has raised uh, this issue to be considered within the, within the agenda of uh, uh, COP27. So we'll have to see, you know, how it progresses. Thank you so much. And Kavi, before you take off, big thanks to you for joining us today and making your presentation. And um, perhaps we'll see each other in Egypt in a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, thanks again. Thank you so much. Um, for Thank you. Absolutely. So we'll continue with our Q&A. We have about 20 minutes left, which is great with our remaining panelists. Um, and Adele, I'm going to direct this one to you first, and then we'll hear from Ritu and Taylor in response. Um, and I'm going to go back and revisit Taylor's presentation a little bit, which was sort of focused on sort of, you know, teeing up this idea of why this issue is so important for a U.S. federal policymaker audience to understand. Um, and, uh, you know, our audience, a congressional audience, a federal policymaker audience, um, how is this important? Why is this important for a congressional audience to understand? And what should our, congress what should our congressional audience know about how and why the issues we're talking about today are different, different, or maybe complementary to other forms of foreign assistance that the United States might provide, whether it's humanitarian aid or disaster recovery or development assistance or climate finance. Could you help put some of these loss and damage issues in into that context for us? Yeah, sure. So I think the from the Glasgow dialogue developed countries and the US have highlighted that they already provide some form of assistance to address loss and damage, largely through humanitarian aid and overseas development aid. Um, but there are clear studies that show that this assistance is not enough to support the levels of loss and damage that are being experienced now and that will be experienced in the future. It's simply not enough. Um, so, for example, um, in Fiji in 2020, there was a cyclone Yasa economic losses of over 54 million in the agricultural sector alone. Humanitarian aid was approximately half a million dollars. Or in the Bahamas, which is where I'm from, we had Hurricane Dorian in 2019, economic losses of over $3 billion. Humanitarian aid was just a fraction of that. And so developing countries are left holding the, holding the bag of responding to these impacts while at the same time trying to develop. Humanitarian assistance also doesn't address longer term needs, such as rebuilding homes, vital infrastructure. Humanitarian assistance normally you know, covers that immediate response right after a disaster happens. It also doesn't address loss and damage coming from slow onset events. Um, for ecosystems, such as loss of biodiversity, those non-economic losses and damages that we've talked about. Um, so while humanitarian aid is very much needed and appreciated, it really just focuses on that immediate aftermath and it doesn't address the full spectrum of loss and damage needs. In terms of overseas development aid, one of the big issues is that there are some countries that are not eligible for that. Um, so small islands in particular, some of them um, have higher levels of income that preclude them from being eligible for aid, um, although they are facing <laughs> disproportional loss and damage due to their vulnerabilities. Um, so the overall picture of loss and damage and finance and its relationship to existing sources of support is that those existing sources of support are not enough now and they will not be enough in the future and this is why there's a push for sort of a, um you know a global approach under the unfccc to come up with the levels of support that are needed for developing countries thanks and ritu and taylor uh, please feel free to chime in as well so you know just adding on to what adele said so it's I would also add anticipate reaction. That's something we need uh, along with the immediate humanitarian response and also helping communities build back better. For example, if you talk about Bangladesh, uh, everyone talked about the recent cyclones where, where, where they said, you know, Bangladesh did a great, great job with great cyclone early warning system. Not a single life was lost. But what happened after that, there was no support to build back their lives. All the land was, uh, all the agricultural land was salinated. 
they were uh, casted by sand and everything. So that was a permanent loss. And for that, they had no support. So how do they build back their lives? And that's a big issue. And that leads to a whole lot of secondary and tertiary and other ripple effect that happens as a result of that. Uh, but, you know, just while uh, developing, because we, you know, in our deliberative dialogue process and even the recent uh, uh, interactions that we had, one thing that developing countries do not want is another process or a mechanism like uh, GCF. Because they know, you know, the gestation period in itself, while they request the demand and by the time it receive, they receive it, it's, it's like a two to three year long process. That's not the kind of waiting period that a developing country facing loss and damage can wait for. What they really need is something like a national mechanism, a national platform, where they are allowed, the funds are provided to them and allow them to blend in other uh, sources of finance, be it uh, development aid, ODA, uh, private sector finance, insurance finance, to build on that and then uh, devolve it to subnational and local level. So that's the kind of mechanism they're talking of right now. So I'll just uh, let Taylor come in. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Adele and, and Ritsu have covered this very well and far better than I could, but maybe just to echo those points, I think all of the numbers and evidence we have show that the existing support through humanitarian assistance or disaster response or whatever it is um, are falling short of the needs and, and, and far short at that. Um, and then they're also, um, as Adele has said, you know, those are not sort of comprehensive um, responses to what uh, loss and damage is intending to cover. It doesn't cover non-economic loss and damage, for example, slow onset events. There's clearly a gap between that immediate humanitarian response and longer term development. And I think that's one of the, one of the, uh, the gaps that, that loss and damage can fill. Thank you so much for that. Um, Go ahead, can, I, can I just come in quickly? So, you know, I, I don't know whether everyone has been following that news, uh, the recent uh, announcement of Global Shield. And that again has been fitted as, oh, this is a very good global process by which you, you know, this will be a good uh, response to loss and damage financing needs. But then again, that's not sufficient uh, because what it would cover is probably insurance uh, support, but what about the anticipatory action to move people to safety? Uh, or um, uh, providing other humanitarian support. That, that's something. So what I'm saying is, while a lot of these global mechanisms are being developed, um, uh, V20 is announced and you know, uh, this global sheet's being announced, but you know, the very nature of loss and damage is such that it needs a very, very comprehensive response, a range of response. They cannot be just one solution. And it has to be very, very tailored, very nuanced, to different types of needs. So that requirement has to be left to the local level for them to decide how they want to use that finance, what kind of infrastructure, support, technology, capacity building, or knowledge support they would need to deal with those loss and damage in their context. Mm. That's a great point. It's, um, you know, thinking about it um, as, you know, um, a, a, a sort of allowing the recipient to define what's required, not the provider. Um, to define what's required. So thank you for that. Um, Ritu, I think we're going to come back to you and ask you this next one, and then we'll hear from Taylor and Adele as well. Um, and and I'm, I'll start with you because you've mentioned Bangladesh a few times. Um, and I'm curious if you could um, provide some additional examples of when a country or a community or a region experiences loss and damage. What are the ripple effects? Like, what are the economic migration human rights, geopolitical effects that can result when there isn't the type of resource to help these communities, countries, or regions cope with loss and damage? So yes, one thing, two things that came out very strongly from all our research uh, since last year was uh, forced displacement, distress migration, and all the mental health, anxiety, and well-being issues that it creates. But the problem with the way some of our evidence was collected, it was very case study driven. So when you take that to policymakers, it doesn't cut ice with them. They want numbers. They want to understand oh, what percentage got impacted. We want some numbers around that. So I was, I was fascinated by the way Adele uh, explained uh, from uh, IPCC report, uh, medium um, uh, confidence, high confidence, and so on. But 
you know, we, so so then we started to understand, uh, you know, try, try to understand as to what extent. Uh, for example, if you just look at climate migration and uh, modern slavery or trafficking issue, and we had to really come out uh, with a lot of uh, innovative approach to capture some of that. Because how do you go and ask a migrant whether have you been trafficked? Are you suffering modern slavery? So you have to come out with a lot of methodological innovation in the way you capture some of that data. But what really came out from our study, and we picked up two areas in India. One was Palamu, which is a drought affected area. And second was in Kendrapada, which is a cyclone and flood affected area. It's a coastal area. And while the percentage of migrant population was almost same in both areas, but in slow onset event area, the trafficking percentage was as high as 42%. So 42% of the migrants were subjected to trafficking. And only 16% were subjected to trafficking in a rapid onset area. And initially, when the data started coming, I thought there's something wrong with this data. So I actually went and started. So one thing was clear is slow onset, as you know, other panelists have also mentioned, slow onset events, they almost like a, act like a slow poison. Nobody notices them. There is a heat wave, there's a cyclone, there's a flood, media is splashed with their news. Nobody ever reports, like they, you'll hardly find a reporting on drought, sea level rise, desertification, salination, whereas they create far greater impact on community. And because there is no, like it's not hyped in the media, nobody cares for them. There is no humanitarian response. There is no support for them. And that's why in the absence of that, they are left to fend for themselves. And that's the reason why it left. And the other issue in India also is there is a lot of political economy around drought declaration because drought affects much bigger area. So they never come out with drought declaration. Whereas they have a cyclone early warning system, they have a, so I'm just saying there are a lot of other factors that contribute to people become, becoming vulnerable to some of these secondary and tertiary impacts of loss and damage. While migration was inevitable, but trafficking could have been avoided that modern slavery could have been avoided, that anxiety and that could have been avoided by providing them a safety net, uh, by providing them a decent uh, migration or um, a safe migration pathway. So these are some of the issues. And then I'll just uh, uh, touch upon something that Adele also mentioned, was around displacement and internal migration. So, you know, this is an issue which I've, I've faced both from World Bank and IAM colleagues is they only recognize internal migration, internal displacement, and cross-border migration is something which has not been recognized by them. They say that's still not an issue. Uh, whereas from our research, it has come out very strongly. It's not just immediate country that they migrate to, they're migrating much further area. And typically when they're migrating much further area, they are subjected to more trafficking in those areas. So uh, I'll stop there and I'll let uh, the uh, panelists to come in. Thank you. Taylor, from your perspective, what are some other ripple effects from when loss and damage is experienced? Sure. Well, as I was um, uh, trying to set out in, in the presentation to some extent, you know, I mean, climate change is such a wicked problem because it is a systemic risk. You know, it's it's transboundary. It's it's non-stationary. Um, you know, the word that often is used is that it cascades across a society in you know, sometimes predictable, but often unpredictable and complex ways. So um, as Richie says, it is, it's not just that immediate um, direct effect of when the hurricane hits and you can see the infrastructure damage, um, which is what, of course, you know, most people tend to think of right away. It's, it, it brings um, lots of, of, of indirect um, secondary third order effects around financial instability, either at an individual or macroeconomic level, uh, loss of livelihoods, displacement, um, and as we've as we've already heard, you know, potentially as one um, one driver of of conflict and instability. So, um, you know, so that it, it clearly does um, sort of cascade uh, across society in, in, in complex ways um, uh, beyond just uh, those those initial impacts. Which again is another reason I think it speaks to needing. Uh, a new and sort of dedicated approach to loss and damage that goes beyond some of those existing resources that we already have, like humanitarian assistance or insurance, for example. Adele, please feel free. I'll give you the last word on this question. 
Yeah, just what we're saying in terms of loss and damage affecting sustainable development. Um, so you have an event that occurs, um, developing countries get some aid, as we've discussed, which is not enough, and then they have to go to their limited national budgets to make up that shortfall. And this diverts money away from other sustainable development priorities, such as health, such as education, such as good governance and capacity building. And this in turn then makes those countries more vulnerable to the next set of climate impacts when they happen. So we sort of see this unvirtuous cycle of loss and damage being experienced, eroding sustainable development capacities, and then leading to greater vulnerabilities to the next event that happens. Um, so sort of looking at it from the big picture, you know, loss and damage also related to levels of debt that these countries face, their access to foreign capital. Um, it has much more rippling effects on sustainable development and economic development. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, we are getting close on time, but um, we've had a couple people email us questions around sort of metrics, the type of data that we might need to do additional qualitative or quantitative analysis of loss and damage, how data might be used by governments versus insurance companies to, you know, help um, communities build back. So I think, um, Adele, maybe we'll start with you um, and, and we'll go around the panel and, and let everyone have a chance to chime in. But what are some of the efforts underway to help or what are some w efforts underway to figure out how to measure loss and damage? And what are some metrics, what are some key metrics that you would propose um, that might help us better sort of understand, but also address the problem without, you know, leading to inadvertent or unintended consequences? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so loss and damage, you know, not being a big topic in the UNFCCC has led to sort of this gap in approaches to measure and assess loss and damage. So we have guidelines on how to measure your greenhouse gas emissions. We have guidelines on adaptation, even though that's challenging to try and measure adaptation, but there aren't any guidelines that are on how to address, um, assess loss and damage. And so what we had to do in the IPCC reports is to rely on separate scientific studies that have been done on impacts of climate change and to pull that together into a broad assessment of what's happening um, in terms of loss and damage across the world. There is a clear need for better approaches and metrics outside of the scientific community to assess these losses and damages. Um, we know that countries do have some methodologies in place to sort of capture those immediate damages that happen right after an extreme event, but there aren't many methodologies that are available or that are used to capture non-economic losses or to capture the actual costs of rebuilding recovery that come after those immediate damages that are experienced. Um, and so this relates, we see the V20 has asked for the IPCC to do a special report on loss and damage that would maybe come up with some methodologies that countries could actually use. Um, but overall, it's clearly an area that needs more focus. Um, and so as we're seeing more focus on this within the UNFCCC and the scientific community, then hopefully there will be development of some metrics that countries themselves will be able to use to document the loss and damage that they are experiencing. Thanks. And Ritu and Taylor, please feel free. I'm very curious to hear some of your ideas for how we might develop metrics that um, that help us, um, you know, analyze, but also hopefully solve this issue. So, uh, so one thing, you know, I agree with whatever Adele said. Like there, there is a gap there, and especially there's a gap around how do you quantify uh, non-economic losses and damage? How do you measure cultural damage? Uh, cultural loss uh, or loss of loss of biodiversity is still possible, but loss of language. How do you assign a value to that? So these there are definitely those issues. But at the same time, when we were doing these analysis of uh, NDC and you're trying to suggest to uh, the least developed countries as to how they should be reporting their risks around uh, uh, loss and damage, we asked them to use a multidimensional risk parameter. So not so you know it's the same what vicious cycle what Edel was mentioning that. You know, because 
they are pushed into debt because of loss and damage. They they divert money from the development uh, issues, and and because they're diverted issue money from the development issue, they when they have the next cycle of uh, climate impact, they, they that loss and damage is much higher. So we what we ask them to do is to do a multi-dimensional risk assessment where they they quantify not just their climate risks, but because they look at the state of the institution, they look at the state of uh, gender dimension, human development index, a range of other parameters, and then on the basis of that, they quantify what their risks are, and then work out what kind of technological support, institutional strengthening support, capacity building support that would be needed, and, and, and that. Uh, but having said that, uh, there's still that issue around how do you quantify non-economic losses and damages and we'll really be looking forward to some uh, advice from ipcc around that so yes great thanks and taylor that gives you the last word on the briefing today we're running out but we wouldn't want to end without hearing from you on this question sure i appreciate that and i'll, I'll be brief um i mean there, there's a lot of things underway in terms of you know mapping of existing resources in the gaps you know insurance companies I know are, are assessing their models against different temperature thresholds, um, attribution, science is improving. And I know there was a study by Dartmouth several months ago that was putting in sort of economic cost on historical emissions um, at an individual country um, level. So, you know, the, the, the data and the science continues to improve and, and get fairly precise. There is clearly a gap, I fully, fully agree. I, you know, I would just say, um, you know, I think it's also important not to let that distract from the fact that we can see very clearly um, the impacts that are already here um, and the needs. And we know that there is a gap, certainly in terms of the resources that are available. So I think while that, you know, discussion continues to improve and, and the metrics are developed and the, the science, the science continues to get better. Um, you know, there, there's a lot that, that can be done in the meantime, based on what we what we're seeing every day um, in terms of impacts and in, in, in particularly in most vulnerable countries. Well, thank you very much. Ritu, you said something that kind of made me smile. You said you, you agree with whatever Adele said. And I think that goes for me too, but it also goes for what our other panelists had to say today too. This was a really, really informative panel. So thank you, Adele and Ritu and Taylor and in absentia Kaveh as well for um, helping us understand this extremely complicated um, issue, and I think we'll all um, approach COP27 um, a lot better informed, but also um, more aware of what's at stake on this issue. Um, seems like we're we're coming up to a really important time um, for um, for for delivering the kinds of solutions that developing countries in particular need. So thank you so much for lending your expertise and your perspectives to our briefing today. I'd also like to say thank you to everyone at EESI uh, who makes these briefings possible. Uh, Dan O'Brien, Omri, Emma, Allison, Anna, Savannah, and Molly. Um, Anna and I will actually be at COP27 for the first week. So if anyone in our audience would like to meet up, please just send us a note. Um, you can send us an email. Our email addresses are all online. We'd love to hear from you. Actually heard from a bunch of people after last week's briefing, and I don't even think I mentioned I was going. So um, uh, please feel free to do that. Look forward to potentially collaborating. Um, I'd also like to say thank you very much to our three awesome fall interns, Alina, Shreya, and Nick, for helping us put all of the social media together and briefing notes and things like that. So thank you so much. My colleague Dan O'Brien is going to put up a slide um, with some information about our upcoming briefings. This is the second of four of our COP27 briefings. We have another one next week uh, that we will be um, uh, producing in partnership with our friends at U.S. Nature for Climate, Natural Climate Solutions, that's October 28th, which I think is next Friday. Uh, and then we also have one the following week, just before we leave for Egypt, what's on the table for the negotiations. You won't want to miss that one. Uh, we'll be covering, I'm sure we'll mention loss and damage quite a lot uh, in that briefing as well, because it's uh, very much on the table for negotiations. Um, we will also have a, um, uh, a climate summit recap. Um, after COP27, probably that last week of November slash first week of December, uh, where we look back on COP27, try to interpret the events for a congressional audience and um, think ahead um, from what might be happening in the intervening months between COP27 and COP28. Uh, the best way to follow all of our work is to sign up for our newsletter. 
Uh, we'll have a daily newsletter, COP27 Dispatch. Uh, you can see those email addresses there. And if you haven't already RSVP'd for the other two briefings, um, you wouldn't want to miss out. They're both going to be great conversations. Um, my colleague will next put up a slide with a link to a survey. Uh, if you have a few moments to take our survey to help us understand how the briefing went, did you have any audio problems, video problems? Um, we, uh, I know we didn't get to all the questions. I did try to weave a bunch of them in together around the metrics and account, uh, accounting for all of this, but uh, we read every response and uh, it means a lot when people in our audience take a few minutes to tell us how we did today. Um, I really appreciate that. We will go ahead and wrap it up there. We're a few minutes over, but I think it was well worth it. Uh, thank you again to our four fabulous panelists, and we will see you next week uh, for our briefing about natural climate solutions with our friends at U.S. Nature for Climate. Thanks so much. Have a great day.